How many centuries is it since a great religion shook the world? This question of Andre Malraux points to an odd characteristic of our times, the absence of grand revelation an absence that began many centuries ago and has continued without let up to our present day. And as of today, the absence seems likely to persist. No signs indicate that a new savior or prophet will soon appear on the horizon or that another set of scriptures is about to be published or that God is preparing to speak to humanity again in a thundering voice. Lacking evidence to the contrary, one would be justified in concluding that a great religion will never again shake the world. Perhaps we are mistaken in our insistence that more is to be revealed. Perhaps revelation is finished. Melrose's question, though interesting, has too wide a scope for me to handle. I prefer to reduce it a bit and rephrase it in more specific personal terms so that it comes out like this. How long has it been since religion shook any of us? Since we found ourselves caught up in a spiritual experience where we knew connection, wholeness, where we found insight and clarity, the kind of awareness that enables us to see what had been hidden before when we had an overwhelming sense of being in the presence of something sacred. Maybe you knew such a moment the last time you sat in the sanctuary here, watching candles accumulate, candles of joy and sorrow, and felt yourself able to see the depths of joy and sorrow in all our lives across all time. Or it may have been a few nights ago as you listened to music and could hear it so deeply that instead of hearing it, you were the music while it lasted. Or a spiritual experience perhaps came for you last week when the simple pleasure of splashing in the ocean with your grandchildren was transformed into a sacred ritual in which you, the kids, the shimmering seawater, and all reality were one. Or was it a few months ago in that still white hour of your vigil at the bedside of a failing loved one as you glimpsed in an instant the meaning of life and death? Or was it last spring when you walked through the light and moved with the morning of a mild sun-drenched sun day? Or has it been so long that you cannot quite remember the time or place or circumstances or feelings, but think there once was something? Or have you never known anything you would describe as a spiritual experience? Our June services take up the theme of awakening, a quality of being that is lifted up by many spiritual traditions as desirable and attainable, though not usually present in us without disciplined practice. Awakening seems usually to mean noticing all that is happening inside and outside, being able to be fully present without our typical distracted mind state, being willing to be fully present, even when whatever is happening is boring or unpleasant. And one quality that both encourages awakening and is present in a person who has awakened is the quality of reverence a special kind of attention that means one is particularly noticing the deeper currents of life, 
the presence of God or a surrounding sacred mystery, the interplay of darkness and light, good and evil, the patterns that give rise to meaning. We tend to think of reverence in exaggerated religious terms. A reverent attitude involves hushed voices, bowed heads, no moving around, perhaps even an element of fear. Contrast that with the story attributed to Mark Twain, who said that two people caught their first glimpse of the Grand Canyon. One person fell to her knees and began to pray. The other slapped his knees and yelled, hot damn. <laughs> Twain concluded by observing that these two responses are the same. Both are responses of reverence, despite how very different they look. I saw reverence in my childhood Baptist church in the form of the expectation that I sit quietly, not talk, and at least give the appearance of listening to the sermon, though I almost never was. Not surprisingly, I was startled and then pleased when I first learned of Unitarianism from a college classmate who told me in her church they sat in a circle of chairs smoking cigarettes and almost never talked about God. Is one of those scenes more reverent than the other? Yet even as Unitarians, we tend to default to the image of sitting still and being quiet as being what reverence looks like. Yet, I have repeatedly heard in many of my congregations arguments about clapping after music versus remaining silent about children making noise versus being sent out so that silence prevails, about classical music being more suitable for church than pop music. Though I have yet to hear any Unitarian Universalist refer to proper church behavior in terms of respect for God, I have received an earful about what constitutes appropriate church decorum. And it is invariably sitting still and being quiet, much as my childhood Baptist church taught me. I find myself wondering this morning when all of you present for the service are tuning in from the privacy of your homes, are you being reverent there? <laughs> are you being as reverent as you would be if you were here in the sanctuary? And if you have a particular kind of reverent behavior here, why is that not present when you join the service online? A congregant once told me that she actually preferred participating in live streamed services because she could unload the dishwasher while listening to the sermon. Is that reverent behavior? Rather than associating reverence strictly with churchy settings and the sorts of things one does in a churchy setting, it may be more helpful to look at times and places where we feel reverent but are not sitting in a church, listening to a sermon, or even admiring stained glass rather than listening to a sermon. For myself, I remember my very first look at a real mountain not just the high hills, high hills that sometimes pass for a mountain in flat parts of the country. During my high school years, my family took a driving trip to Washington, D.C. that called for us to travel on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Our car had labored up one of the first significant peaks, and we stopped at a scenic overlook. Never had I seen that sort of vast expanse from so great a distance. Or I remember the morning the horse I owned as a child gave birth. While she delivered her foal in the middle of the night, my father woke me early in the morning to follow him out into the pasture where I saw a spindly-legged creature take its first steps and then begin to nurse. What ties these sorts of disparate experiences together is a special kind of attention that comes with being awake and seems to be part and parcel of being reverent. 
borrowing part of a definition from author Barbara Brown Taylor in her book, An Altar in the World, this kind of attention involves responding with awe when something is going on that reminds us of our limits. Because the presence of the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth, is one such clear reminder in traditional religions, it was inevitable that churches, places where God supposedly hung out, became teachers of reverence. But Taylor notes that birth, death, sex, nature, truth, and justice can accomplish the same end without bringing God into the picture. What stops you in your tracks these days? What claims your attention so strongly that you cannot help looking at it besides your cell phone? What rouses you from your routines, makes you catch your breath, moves you to prayer, whether in a quiet position or crying or laughing or shouting four letter words, not in anger because, but because no other words are strong enough. Don't be surprised if it takes you a moment to think of something. Our culture is profoundly irreverent. Discouraging, even ridiculing feelings of awe <clears throat> in favor of the been there, done that attitude. Even more perniciously, we're encouraged on all sides to regard ourselves as all powerful having control of our lives at every step, capable of anything, anything, if we just set our minds to it. We're taught that a human being is a package of unlimited potential, which means probably not inclined to experience the sorts of limits to the self that reverence wants to remind us of. And if I never have to bump up against my limits, then it becomes so easy for me to trample over yours, to violate your boundaries, to deny you respect. Reverence helps me know where I end and others begin. It teaches me that I am almost never, or maybe never, the most important person in the room. Reverence keeps me from getting a big head, a lesson that everyone about me will always be eager for me to learn, just as I am eager for you to learn the same lesson. From this perspective, many of the disheartening aspects of our common life, our disregard for our environment, our polarized politics, families struggling with dysfunction, general rudeness seem to be rooted in part in our diminished capacity for reverence. Turning to church, the longtime expert on all things reverential might seem a good place to start learning how to be reverent but that becomes tricky in a Unitarian Universalist setting due to the association of reverence with God and what do we do about that? Beyond the God question, churches of all kinds, not just our liberal churches, have lost touch with reverence in many ways. Eager to be all things to all people, churches focus on encouraging feeling good, on familiarity and comfort, and are tempted to sidestep any sort of talk that might invite a different response. For how do we open up an experience of something bigger without seeming as though at the same time we're downsizing the self? In her discussion of reverence, Taylor spends some time with the story of Moses and the burning bush, a classic instance of an experience that invites a reverent response. To recall the story, having fled Egypt after murdering an Egyptian overseer while defending 
a Hebrew slave, Moses takes up residence with a tribe of desert dwellers and marries into the family. Out tending the sheep one day, Moses notices the phenomenon of a bush on fire without being burned up. But Moses does more than just notice it and then reach for his cell phone. As Taylor emphasizes in her recounting of the story, Ma Moses makes the crucial decision to turn aside. And it is in turning aside that everything else is set in motion. As a revelation of God and a mission to lead the Hebrew people to freedom unfolds once Moses has turned aside to take a closer look. Such a simple, simple decision. Yet turning aside, a single action in itself is not a simple decision. For to turn aside means to be willing to be distracted. To stop for a moment the headlong rush to the next thing on my list to believe for an instant that whatever I'm doing is actually not the most important thing in the universe. Turning aside is a first critical step in the direction of learning my limits because it requires me to acknowledge that some things, some experiences, some demands, some people do take priority over me that there is a whole wide world of life going on without my participation and without my endorsement, that my plans for myself are not necessarily the sum total of my experience. If I never turn aside, then I never have the chance to see what else is going on besides what I intend or create. And this can be an extraordinarily difficult move for us to make. As Taylor observes, we pay attention to the speedometer, the clock, the phone, the list of things to do, all of which feed our illusion that life is ultimately manageable. And none of these meets the first criterion for reverence, which is to remind us that we are not in charge of it all. If anything, these devices sustain the illusion that we could yet be in charge of it all if we can only find the way to do more and do it faster. To cultivate reverence outside of churchy settings and in ways that are not so church influenced. We might start by simply being willing to slow down for a moment and be distracted by something other than the phone or whatever task we were intent on accomplishing. This will not come easily for us. But one particular source of help we can use in learning to be reverent by being willing to turn aside comes from the youngest of us, from our children. If you've ever gone for a walk with a small child, you know that such a walk will not raise your heartbeat or constitute your daily cardio workout, nor will you reach your destination in an efficient amount of time. This is because a child is infinitely willing to be distracted from marching along by pretty much everything. A flower, a crack in the sidewalk, a rock, a butterfly, a dog, a child playing in the neighbor's yard. There's nothing so ordinary that it deserves being dismissed or ignored. Everything is an occasion for stopping, for paying attention, for being reverent. That behavior goes against so much of what we've been taught and value as busy people who pride ourselves on our busyness. But busyness will not offer options for awakening if being awake is truly what we seek.
practicing reverence offers possibilities for awakening. Awakening, in turn, increases our capacity for being reverent. Spiritual practices can help with learning to be reverent and awake. We're also surrounded by teachers offering us opportunities for such learning. Jesus is reported as having urged us to consider lilies and be his children. Those teachings were probably his version of saying to us, as we say sometimes to one another or to our children, hey, look at that. If we can lift our eyes from all the busyness of our lives, perhaps we too, along with children and other wise people, can again wake up to the glory of all that surrounds us all the time so that we too once more are moved to shout, hot damn. May it be so. Amen.